Good morning to you at home, our awesome audience for the 2021 edition of the IAB Youth Council's Future Masters Town Hall. We are coming to you live and direct from different parts of South Africa this morning, shout out to technology, uh, with an amazing program of speakers and panelists who are some of the rising stars in this country's digital marketing, media and advertising industries. The Town Hall presents a wonderful opportunity for young people in the industry to come together, take center stage and discuss issues and topics relevant to us. Um, and that's exactly what we'll be doing this morning with a focus on mentorship in the industry, what it is, what it means, why it is important. And to find out more about the status of mentorship, we are running a poll this morning. And the question is very simple. Do you have a mentor? So make sure to answer below. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker for our town hall, I do want to get into some house rules. Nothing hectic, I promise. Uh, first of all, since we are on Zoom, which I'm sure we're all vaguely familiar with, I'm going to kindly ask that you keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the session in the gallery. Uh, should you have a question that pops up, pops up during our keynote or panel sessions, um, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom right on your screen. I will personally be going through those, so I'll make sure to get through as many as we can during the panel discussion. Finally, please do follow IAB underscore SA for, on your preferred social media platform using the hashtag, hashtag IAB Future Masters. There's an awesome giveaway up for grabs for the most engaging attendee today, which is Kojo Bufo's debut book, Listen to Your Footsteps. I'm sure we all want it. So make sure you tweet, gram post, whatever it is that, we, that you do, we will be watching and we'll choose a winner at the end of the event today. Now, a warm welcome to our brilliant keynote, Ian Mangena, who is the founder of Digital Go Africa, a digital studio that uses digital skills training to bridge the gap between women in Africa and technology. It is no surprise then that she has been voted one of Mail and Guardian's 200 most influential young South Africans. A budding transdisciplinary designer whose career in civil society began just over six years ago when she began advocating for young women's participation in political processes at an international level. Ian has since used her activism and creative design capabilities to advocate for women's access and inclusion in the digital economy. Her work is at the intersection of technology, design, um, and advocacy, and is concerned with rethinking new systems and experiences to solve social problems. Currently, uh, Ian is completing her landscape architecture degree as if she's not doing enough uh, at the University of Cape Town and plans to use a, cy a cyber ethnographic work carried out uh, through Digital Girl Africa to explore how smart cities in Africa can serve women in the future. Welcome, Ian. Uh, you can go ahead and turn your video on. Uh, thank you so much for making time this morning to speak to us. How are you? Hi, Swanile. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry for that wordy bio, I swear. I'm going to keep it. No, neat. it's not wordy at all. I mean, you know, we have to sort of celebrate our achievements and you have done some amazing work. So we are looking forward to your uh, your address this morning um, and, and to learn something new. Um, and I am going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Ian. Thank, take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks to Swingile for reading out my bio and uh, thanks to the IAB Youth Council for um, inviting me to give the keynote address. As Swingile said, yes, my name is Ian Mangenga. Advocacy is what I do. Design and tech is how I do it. Access and inclusion is why I do it. So excuse me if I'm going to be jumping around. I'm going to be reading my notes just so that I cover everything because this is more like a, um, a tell all session for me, sharing my experiences that I haven't had the platform to share yet. So if you see a little tears here and there, just excuse the mess. Um, so, yeah, as Lumila said, I, advocacy is what I do. Design and tech is how I do it. Access and inclusion is why I do it. It has a nice ring to it, right? But it actually took me years to get there. I went from, I went from being a content creator to being a content curator to being an experiential designer, a creative activist, 
a digital designer, and now I consider myself um, a social designer. And it might change tomorrow, so don't get attached to anything. My long, winded, short career journey is both the cause and effect of why I'm most honored to be here today to talk about mentorship. When I was asked to deliver the keynote, I took it as a message from the universe to stop crying and put on my boots and go dance in the rain. But I'll get to that a little later. In the next 20 minutes or less, I want to share my highs and lows of navigating social entrepreneurship without a mentor until I found the mentorship I needed in the community I had created. So let's start you off with a bit of context. I'm born, bred, and buttered in Johannesburg. My hometown is Foslo, a small township 20 minutes east of Johannesburg. And having went to school in the city, primary school in the city and high school, um, starting off in Berea to be specific, uh, right at the height of Hillbro being the most dangerous place in South Africa. <laughs> Um, I started navigating these streets of Joburg's inner city with my friends um, at the age of 10. So if you're ever wondering where I got my, um, my street skills or my hustle mentality, it definitely is from navigating Hillbro, Yovo, Berea from 10 years old. My childhood is speckled with many trips in and out of the city or the township. And it was in these journeys, um, I felt that I started formulating my own questions about society, inequality, and possible solutions for some of the issues that I saw around me. No wonder when it came to choosing a career, I struggled a lot, and I just couldn't make my mind up for a long time. So I like to think of myself as an accidental CEO, and this is my journey as an accidental CEO without a mentor. So I say I'm an accidental CEO because I never went into Digital Girl Africa or anything before that with the goal of being the boss. In fact, I always tried to do things with my friends, but this time it was different. As soon as I started Digital Girl Africa, I realized how important the work is and that I could not stop and I just had to continue with or without any guidance. Growing up as a millennial in a community where most of the parents are white collar or blue collar workers meant always having people discourage you from pursuing a creative career. So I studied a science degree at WITS, majoring in geography and archeology. span And that's where my love for city cultures, tech and the past began. You see, for the first time, I finally had the vocabulary to describe the poverty and inequality I saw around me. And it was from that moment that design as a problem solving tool became my first language. This then led to me being involved in various student organizations like the Vizpoet Society. In 2014, I ran for SRC, but did not make it by five votes, which was sad then, but a blessing now because it gave me a chance to explore other ways to be involved in the community, like um, with with civil society organizations. So I was the chairperson of a um, of a student chapter organization on campus for two years. And it was not until I was 20 years old that I took a firm decision to engage more directly with social issues when I decided to be in student politics and then civil society, which catapulted my career into an international stage where I started advocating for the participation of young women in policy and other decision-making processes Having that kind of exposure at 22 years old changed my entire template on how I wanted to spend my time here on earth. In 2018, I had been working for just over a year as a, um, as a brand agent for one of the biggest organizations in the country doing work on youth unemployment. And I had a feeling that I want to create more social impact. So I organized my first digital workshop in Ikuruleni with just under 200 Joanne, if I'm correct. I asked a friend to facilitate the workshop for me because I knew I would be too busy making sure that everything is going okay, like 
the soup I had made in the morning and was still cooking in one of those slow cooker bags that Raja was giving out at some point for free. And the soup actually came in handy because I knew that I don't have money to feed the girls that were coming to the workshop, but I could quickly make a soup. It rained on the day, so it was just perfect when the universe aligned. The workshop was a success. We had 13 women attend and they all expressed their gratitude for the workshop as digital content creation was something they had not yet considered in their lives. Now more than ever, I find it very important that I share that part of my start because um, I realize that a lot, I, I encounter a lot of women who are unable to take the first step because they're always waiting for some, um, some, for some financial sponsorship, either funding, that's the big word that I hear, funding, funding, funding. And um, I don't know who's going to tell you this, but you know, it's always better if you start with what you have around you and the people that will support you will see your commitment to it and also back you up. So we had our first workshop. Still in 2018, I registered Digital Girl Africa. We were official, had an official bank account. We were nice. Girl power was moving. 2019, um, so a few months later, while well in 2018, actually, um, I joined Timur Lohong Innovation Hub as one of the entrepreneurs who were a part of the community. Initially, when I got there, I was working on a different media idea. I got to the final round of pitches, but unfortunately I didn't win. So um, my attention was now fully back on Digital Girl Africa. I was organizing more workshops and boot camps, doing more research on how to use tech to transform women's lives. Listen, I was an entire company on my own. I woke up every day and left for Brown and came back around 8 p.m. religiously. My mother had no clue that I had left my job. She only found out later in the year on TV when I had appeared on your TV. And she just didn't understand how how have I been living? <laughs> Who has she been living with? <laughs> um, I was making more than I was earning in my previous job. I was doing what I love and the sky was my limit. This city girl was up. I worked like this tirelessly until the last days of 2018 and only went on holidays a few days before I was set to go on um, an election observing mission in the DRC. When I returned to South Africa, it was a new year and we were all looking forward to our vision boards and and and. Little did I know that I had a burnout lurking nearby. So I had my first workshop and then I then decided to go to Cape Town to relax a little. My second day in Cape Town, I decided that I'm not going back to Joburg because there's nothing for me there. So I needed a way to survive in Cape Town. I still organized some workshops in, in Joburg and I still organize and, and I started organizing some workshops in Cape Town while working um, full time. I was now popping, I was a millennial manager, forgot all about social entrepreneurship. And um, I actually managed to organize two boot camps at the time. And this was still in 2019. In 2020, I then decided to go back to school. I decided to go back to school and study landscape architecture, something I've always been passionate about and I felt was the next stage of my journey as a designer. Of course, this meant I had to leave my job, which gave me time to refocus on Digital Girl Africa. But the year had other plans. Literally mid-2020, everything is under lockdown. But I was still continuing scheming in the background while I was still going through the most. Um, and going through, uh, going through the lockdown um, and juggling school and, you know, this burning passion of um, minimizing the digital gender gap in Africa really forced me to forced me to to choose some truths which I ignored, which led to the next part of my presentation. And when I went into this, there were a couple of truths that I knew on an entrepreneurship level. One 
was that the small break I took in 2019 had delayed the growth of Digital Girl Africa. So there was a lot more pressure now to shoot up. Two, digi Digital Girl Africa stopped being about me a long time ago. So I needed to make sure that it succeeds without me there so that I can pursue my other adventures. Three, this mission was too big for me to handle by myself. I knew I needed a community to do this. And that's when I started thinking about a slow digital revolution. It was in my isolation that I started thinking a lot about the kind of internet I see as a thriving environment for women in Africa. The words sustainable, low emotional stress and environmental impact kept ringing in my head. And then it hit me. Perhaps the world is telling us to go slower, to stop everything and reflect and remember our humanity and how it's connected to everything around us. This is how a slow digital revolution came about. SLOW is an acronym for sustainable and low environmental and the imaginary emotional <laughs> over the impact. If there's one thing that 2020 taught me is that we had all been stuck trying to teach old dogs new tricks, but that time had come to an end. And when I thought about what this meant for women and technology in Africa, my ideas about what Digital Girl Africa shifted from a space where women learn critical digital skills into a community that is working together to curate a wholesome online experience for women. So I set a goal to get 100 women who I would create the slow digital revolution with. In July, we put out a call for women to join the slow tribe. And the slow tribe was is a collective of independent, creative, curious, digital collaborators working indie collectively to amplify women's role and presence in the digital economy. We had over 65 applications and ended up with the tribe of 21 women. And that is when the trouble started for me. I was now at the peak of my exam season and I had now committed most of my time to working with this group of women. And every time I would try and consult different people, I would always get advice that would force me to choose between the two. And at that point, I couldn't choose any. I couldn't choose school over Digital Girl Africa because Digital Girl Africa was paying for my bills. I couldn't choose Digital Girl Africa over school because school is meant for my long-term uh, sustainability. So I just had to stick it out. So we went on and we worked on the slow digital revolution. Um, I put together some slow principles that are there to guide us. And I think these slow principles are not only important for the, for the work that I do in Digital Girl Africa, but they also touch, they're also relevant for the topic, for today's topic on mentorship, because what happened last year is all that time spent in isolation made us value, uh, made us appreciate and value community a whole lot more. And the slow principles are just some guiding values that I created with the community as some framework that can guide us and lead us as we start to think of a new normal. So the first one is care economy. The care economy is about creating value around women's unrecognized contribution to the traditional economy. The second principle is humanocracy, a human-centric structure and approach that is about dismantling hierarchies and challenging structures of privilege. The third one is access. This is about making the circle bigger by opening up the internet and making it everyone's playground. Number four is inclusion, creating safe spaces online for multiple narratives to coexist. Number five is community and is all about amplifying the value of togetherness. Six is collaboration and focuses on prioritizing skill sharing as another form of the share economy. Second last is digital hygiene. 
It focuses on adopting healthy online uh, practices that help us grow mentally and emotionally. Number eight is calling culture. Doing away with cancel, with cancel culture and understanding that we become better people through unlearning and relearning. We, we created a lot of amazing things um, as a slow tribe. We met on Fridays to discuss alternative tech topics in our slow seminars. And we also put together the slow fest. And then um, tragic, um, the tragedy happened. So now it's after slow fest, it's post 16th December, and I'm still busy with the exam and I'm feeling overwhelmed because um, none of the advice that I took made sense for me. So I decided to soldier on by myself. And when I said, when I was asked to deliver the keynote speech, I took it as a message from the universe to stop crying and put on my boots and go dance in the rain. I really meant it. Because for a long time after that, after the, after the festival in, in December, I spent so much time reflecting on all the things that didn't go well. And because I, I'm the founder and by default leader of the community, I absorb the failures more than anyone else. And I see each and every little thing that goes wrong. And during a time like the one we're existing in, it's so difficult to be able to separate um, your external failures from your personal failures. So I thought of everything that went wrong about the first, about our model as a personal failure. And had I had a mentor and a specific kind of mentor, I would have been able not only to deal with our failures, but to bounce back quickly. But little did I know that the mentorship that I always needed had always been around me. So had I had a mentor, I would have understood, my journey would have looked a little bit like this. Year one, 2018, begin, and then take a break, acknowledge progress, and rest. Year two, 2019, continue, then acknowledge progress, acknowledge progress, then rest. Year three, go on with the slow digital revolution, acknowledge progress, and rest. My search for a mentor had always been about looking for someone outside of me, someone very far from me. And yes, I understand, you know, we're looking for people that inspire us, people that are in spaces that we want to get into, you know, but I really need to say this, 2020 was not the best time to go shopping for a mentor because people, even the very mentors that I had identified were also going through their own personal problems. And I think that in retrospect, not having a mentor really worked out in my favor because I realized that while I was going outside to look for a mentor, everything I needed was within the community, within the slow tribe. And I'll tell you why it was within the slow tribe. So mentorship, um, according to um, the, the definition I Googled, I'm not sure which dictionary it is. <laughs> Mentorship means the guidance provided by a mentor, especially an experienced person in a company or educational institution. So the two most important things there are guidance and experience. Through the community, I was able to get all of that because of these three Ps by, uh, that I learned from Linda Green, who is, um, who worked at the BBC as one of, as one of the executives. Um, but then I also added my, my fourth P. So through community, you have people and the people create, um, act as your community or your network. And through this community and net, network, you're able to create a space where, you're, where you can see your shortfalls, all your strengths, your weaknesses, places that you can um, grow in, and gives you just like the space to, to break certain patterns that can allow you to refine your purpose. And when you have all of that in check, you have progress. And personally, I'm just 
over the idea of having to go to one person for advice and guidance. It's almost like um, toxic professional monogamy, you know? You can't expect everyone to be this amazing person in their own organization, company, to their family, to their friends, and still be able to give you 100% guidance and mentorship on certain things. I think it's important that we learn how to diversify um, our emotional, mental, psychological needs uh, so that when one person is not, avail is, is not available, you're still able to get the support, but from someone else. So 2021, 22, now I have figured out that, you know what, I actually, besides the fact that the type of mentorship that I needed was not the same as the one that I received from individuals, because I feel I needed creative mentorship more than anything. And that's something that is rare to find in, in our industry, in the creative industry, because there's a certain there's a certain look, you know, there's a certain look that leaders have. You all have that one pose where your arms are crossed and you're looking over your shoulder. You're always dressed in formal clothes and, and, and. But that has never been me. And I could never relate to that. What I need is a different type of mentorship. One that is more personal. So now that I know all of this, um and through the community most importantly because we had a feedback session and the feedback wasn't easy feedback wasn't easy to take but i think it's most it's, it's the most important place to get feedback from because these are the people i was working with these are the people that i'm creating digital girl africa for as well you know so who else to give me better advice on how to improve than the people i'm serving so now here I am, round two of a slow digital revolution, ready to go again. And this is where we're at now. So through the help of a slow tribe, we're still working on amplifying 100 women's uh, presence online. We are on just under 20 at the moment. Um, so the next iteration of Digital Girl Africa is focusing on widening women's access to digital skills and opportunities. We are a woman-focused digital hub that widens women's focus, uh, widen women's access to digital skills and opportunities. And we do this by crowdsourcing educational content and making it accessible to women in different communities. And we do it because we want an accessible and inclusive digital economy. We run two main projects, our digital academy and our digital studio. Our digital academy is where we provide all the educational content uh, through the assistance of our volunteering experts and institutions. Our studio is a social tech studio that uses tech design and activism to help brands and organizations create campaigns that result in social interventions directed at women. We collaborate with communities to create transformative social tools for their movement. And we do this together as a tribe. And what I love most, what I love the most about the studio and working on the second iteration of the studio post my personal pandemic is that together with the tribe, we're now able to really re rethink how ownership should look like in the future. So our studio is collectively owned by the tribe and our managing partners, but most shareholders, but the biggest shareholders is the tribe. Um, and yeah, the Slow Tribe, our interdisciplinary community of alumni and shareholders of Digital Girl Studio, all brought together by the common goal of using their collective voice and tech to transform women's lives. Thank you. So, but before I hand it over to Simbongile, I honestly just want to say that had it not been for my community in the absence of a mentor, I wouldn't have been able to 
get up in the mornings and, and still continue. I wouldn't have been able to notice some of the areas that I need um, to work um, that I need to improve on because these are the people I interact with every day and I think the idea of a mentor being a singular person should really be rethought you know our mentors can be men uh, can our friends can be mentors like Sims is an amazing woman who has done amazing stuff in the media space there's nothing wrong with approaching her to be my mentor even with the limited experience that she might have according to the traditional ideas of what a mentor should be um and thank you so much for listening to my highs and lows and my personal tragedies uh looking forward to the q a's well, what an amazing keynote ian thank you um and a lovely um sort of taking us through through your journey and i find it's also a great account of self-awareness in your journey and knowing when where your mentorship needs are um ian is not going anywhere everyone uh, she joins us for our panel discussion set to begin shortly do give her a follow on social media at ian africa with a k to keep the conversation with her going um and a big thank you to you for answering our poll um a surprising 68 percent of you say that you do not have a mentor while 32% of you oh no that now that's changed it's now 66% of you say that you do not currently have a mentor while 32% of you do and I'm hoping the 66% is inspired to seek out that relationship uh, after today's event uh, now I'm going to invite our awesome panel in uh, starting with who is all about the people she says what makes them tick what makes them mad what makes them grow and what makes them change as a creative director at VML YNR. She is a champion for ideas that will not only change but stay in people's lives. Uh, having started her career as a strategist at one of South Africa's leading digital agencies at the time, uh, it's added to her arsenal as a creative, um, ensuring that every piece of work that she touches is in, underpinned by strategy and meets the objectives of both clients and agency. She has worked and won awards on a number of brands from Google Africa, Heineken, Standard Bank, Superbalist, I could go on. Um, and um, uh, she's a member of the IAB Youth Action Council and hosts the IAB Insight series that delivers access to tools and case studies around navigating the world of digital marketing from paid media to data's impact on marketing. Hi, Teho, and welcome to you this morning. Um, and another young woman who joins our panel is Cassidy Nudal, who is a writer and strategist at her core with a passion for cooking and food culture, having dabbled in both food magazine publishing and digital and social strategy. She has found the natural intersection of these two passions in her current role, leading and mentoring a dedicated team of immensely talented young creatives in producing food, food videos for a highly engaged community. By night, Cassidy works with a talented group of women running the She Says Who's Your Mama initiative, pairing budding and eager talent with seasoned veterans in the marketing and media space. Uh, their vision is to bridge skills and experience gaps, create long lasting allyships, and inspire the new generation of talented women through the war stories and hard lessons learned by the generation before. Welcome Cassidy. And lastly, I'm going to welcome Lisa Ho, but definitely not least, who is a brand strategist by trade, currently working as brand manager at South African brewery Signal Hill Products. He boasts a career spanning seven years, which has covered various aspects of brand and communication strategies. What motivates him every day and the work that he does is the potential brands have to positively impact the world by impacting people's outlook into the world, as well as improving the quality of their lives, both uh, of which can come together and improve the state of the world and make a better place. Um, that was a mouthful. You guys are so talented, so brilliant. How are you all this morning? You can go ahead and turn your microphones on. We're good, thank you. That was like I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> deserved, deserved. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Teho, um, with, with a, a question this morning is, um, Black women are under, underrepresented uh, at the highest levels of the inter industry, particularly as creatives and strategists. As someone with a background in both, uh, would you say uh, this makes finding a suitable mentor for yourself a struggle? And if so, how did you work around it? Oh, it's definitely a struggle getting a mentor. I think also just because of the fact that not there aren't that many up there who know what you're going through. So I, I love what, what Ian was referring to of how your community becomes your mentors. So what I've found is that it's also the 
discerning between sometimes it's not that you need a mentor you need like someone to just guide you through a period in your life and I found that there are a lot of times when now when I look back in hindsight it's not that I had a mentor but that particular person was actually guiding me through that stage of my life so yeah it's very hard to find a mentor but what I always encourage people is like the minute you see someone that you feel like you could get a bit of knowledge or wealth from start following them because half the time like I even get mentored via Twitter it sounds ridiculous obviously because <laughs> for most people they're like what Twitter is for all the drama and the cancel culture conversations but I I get inspired by a lot of the conversations that happen from the people that I look up to I mean I think this it was this morning where Usibu Mabena who she tweeted about how like she doesn't she's not an island she doesn't function alone and she listed a whole host of different people who help her from business mentors to Isangoma to a therapist to her friends so I think it's important to discern between also the limitations of how some mentors can't service you because they don't know where you're at they don't they don't know your history they're not you so you almost need to break up your life into different parts so that you can find the right community or people to jump in on that but yeah, it's very hard, but I found that, you know what, it's fine. All of this will be knowledge for me to mentor somebody else. <laughs> Amazing. And I think um, this theme of like sort of community mention mentorship is coming up a lot. And I'd actually like to find out from um, Cassidy, um, who works with, uh, as we said, that she says, who's your mama foundation about sort of how that works, because it does seem sort of like a, a community initiative and something that can done along alongside um, other women. Um, so Cassidy, yeah, tell us about uh, who's your mama, how it started um, and some of your highlights from, from working there. Definitely, thanks, Sim. Um, so Who's Your Mama is an initiative that's actually global. Um, it's connected to She Says, obviously, as you said, um, and it has it is in all the major cities in the world, uh, Cape Town included. It started uh, two years ago now. Um, and what we do is we connect mentors and mentees that are really interested in this mentorship relationship uh, and kind of find their, their uh, areas of interest and expertise and, and match them accordingly. Um, and speaking to this idea of community, um, I was doing a bit of research about this yesterday and I came upon this great term called the brain trust or a personal board of directors for every person. I think that's such a great way of looking at it. And what we're hoping to do at Who's Your Mama is really add to that by reaching outside of your direct networks to people in or women in the industry, uh, whether that be marketing or creative or even further outside of that that you can tap into and include in this brain trust of yours to help you expand your perspective and expand your um, realm of experience and really tap into their, um, their guidance and their advice. Awesome, and I think just to follow up on that, Cassidy, um, what are some of the positive changes you've seen with some of the women that you work with uh, through Who's Your Mama and, and the way that they approach mentorship? I think it's really, um, a good thing to bear in mind that uh, mentorship relationships or matches can sometimes be a hit and miss, and that's okay. Um, it is very much about chemistry, and if you don't hit it off, even if you have the same interests or the same experience or uh, are going in the same direction, that's it's not going to work, and that's okay. So we have had situations where the matches haven't exactly worked, and we've you know made every effort to, to try and match those people um, outside um, of that network and and with somebody else. Um, but it's been really amazing to get some really positive feedback where some people have said that they are answering each other's sentences um, or finishing each other's sentences and they really, really get, get along. Um, and yeah, I have found that their confidence has grown and their career direction or, or trajectory has really improved since having a mentor to help guide them with their own experiences and advice um, you know, further in, in their career and in their uh, jobs. Amazing, we love to see it. Um, over to Lisejo. Um, I think Lisejo, what I'd like to sort of get from you is your personal experience um, through through the work that you've done sort of in advertising. Have you ever had a mentor relationship? Um, if you did, how did it benefit you? And if, if you didn't, do you feel that there's space uh, where that relationship sort of can help you with your career growth? Yeah, so I, I definitely was fortunate enough when breaking into the industry to have a mentor. I think, you know, in my days as an intern, um, what ended up happening was that, you know, my heads of department, our chief of, strat chief of strategy, ultimately were those that played that role. Um, so it was very much in line with the work that we were doing and the work that was expected of me at the agency that I was at at the time. 
Um, but they recognized that they had that you know position that they were able to occupy in being a mentor. And I also realized that there was more to gain from just you know instructions that I would receive on a day to day. So so definitely, I was very fortunate enough to have to have some sort of mentorship at the beginning of my career. But I also do think that it isn't something that is only you know fit for the beginning of your career. I think as one evolves and grows through their careers. Um, there will always be new challenges and there will always be uh, the need on how to understand how best to navigate those challenges. And there'll always be someone who was there before you. So there'll always be room for mentorship um, as you grow. So, yeah, I mean, as something that happened in the beginning of my career, it's not something that I view um, that is only fit for the beginning of your career, but something that's relevant throughout. Yeah, I think I 100% I agree with you there. Um, Ian, have you found uh, the same? And I think as someone who through Digital Girl Africa can be seen sort of as, as a mentor to, to the women and the girls that you work with, um, do you think if there's anything you would have done differently um, in your career sort of in the more leadership and mentor role? Um, yeah, definitely. So I had the privilege of having leadership um, training from like early on in my career, but that was leadership under specific industry, under civil society, like young African leaders, which is way different to leading a team of creators who need you to know what's happening, have the answers. And sometimes we're all just figuring it out, guys. Hey, like as we go, we're figuring it out. And so there's a lot of stuff that I would have done differently, like um, being responsive is very, very important in a community, being able to communicate um, what's happening and just responding to everything that's happening. You know, that's one of my biggest thing that I would have done, uh, just being a better communicator. Awesome. Um, and a question from, I hope I'm saying this right, uh, Tao Rai. Um, and I'm going to pose this to, to you, Ian, and Teho um, as well. Um, if, if you had to sort of go into a mentor mentee relationship where you were the mentor, um, how do you choose the people that you work with? Um, do, you look with do you look for people with certain skill sets um, and experience? Um, yeah, so how, how do you judge? Uh, to sort of take on a mentee. Yeah. Um, do you want to yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I use the same, like the similar framework as I do when I recruit um, slow chat members. Uh, firstly, I want to know what your story is like and what your background is like. And your background is very important for me because myself, I don't have a typical background. I've always been a loner amongst my circular friends. It's like, you know, we're worried about Ian. She needs to get a job, you know? So I'm looking for those people who are highly misunderstood and feel lost because everyone is chasing a corporate nine to five because I have more, there's a lot of similarities between us. And then they they can also be able to draw a lot from my own personal experiences, mainly from my mistakes. Learn from my mistakes and <laughs> don't repeat them. <laughs> How about you, Tahoe? I love that. <laughs> um, for, uh, for me, I think I have the support of, so in the IEB Youth Council, we do a mentor month every six months and we usually like send out a form and people must fill it out. So you get a bit of background from that. But most of the time when someone says like, hey, I want you to be a mentor, whether they've DM me or they've sent me like a message, I often actually just initiate a conversation because sometimes it's also not so much that they want a mentor, but they actually just want to converse with someone about a specific thing that they're going through right now. So I always have the conversation and just by starting that already, you can even, because sometimes maybe I'm not even the right mentor. So that conversation will also help me to go, actually, the perfect person for you to speak to is X. And then I'll, I'll put them into in connection with that person. But I often just, I try and speak to them and just to hear them out on, you know, like what's cooking, what's in your head? Why do you feel like you, you need a mentor and what's happening in your life that you feel like you need guidance on? And let me take it from there. Awesome. Um, and a question from, again, Takia, I hope I'm, I'm <laughs> answering uh, sort of pronouncing your names properly. Liseho, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, 
what do you think is important um, so, to sort of lay the, the foundation and the groundwork between yourself and a mentor? Um, I know you spoke about sort of having mentorship, um, you know, early in your career. Did you ever have to sort of set any boundaries, any ground rules? Um, and what would your advice uh, be to that? Not ground rules specifically, but one thing that I do realize is a commonality, both being a mentor and a mentee, is that beyond and below the skill sets, below the skills that they're wanting to perfect, lying under that is the desire, you know, because from that desire, you get proactivity. From that desire, you get the right attitude. From that desire, you get action. Um, I think what's also important to realize is that you know, when it comes to things such as mentorship, that happens over and above our responsibilities on a day to day. So it isn't something that we just have the time for, we have to kind of create the time for that. But because it's so invaluable, both from a mentor and mentee's perspective, and rewarding and fulfilling, we decide to do it. But without that deeper lying will to want to learn, and likewise will to want to offer knowledge, um, it's, it's very hard for that dynamic and that relationship to move any more forward beyond just the, the meeting the meeting point. So yeah, it, it, for me, it, it does really come down to, you know, desire, will, which informs the action, which informs sustainable mentorship. Amazing. Okay. And then a general question to everybody, um, you know, mentorship or rather the search for more, more knowledge and advice can lead to a bit of like information overload um, and contradictory to advice um, and, and, and simply it's like too many cooks and in the kitchen. And um, how do you achieve a balance in your relationship with your mentors and, and some of maybe you who have um, mentees and sort of re refining the quality of that information? Um, Cassidy, I'll start with you. Um, I'm actually going to uh, pass on a bit of advice that my mentor gave me, and I think it's really yes. important. Awesome. Yes. It was actually in the context of feedback, and because feedback is something that uh, is very important in the company that I work with in, um, but it also applies very nicely to mentorship in that she said, you can take feedback and you should definitely consider it, but it doesn't always fit in with who you are as a person and how you want to do things. And I think the same can be said for advice in that you should definitely seek out advice from different perspectives and different people and definitely consider those. Um, and you'll definitely find some things will hook, I guess, in your brain and, and you'll keep and you will and it will resonate with you and, and you will take that on in your life. And others you might might not resonate with you and then you pass it on. And yeah, I, I, I also think when it comes to mentorship, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily always be an ongoing long-term relationship with another person. I think it can also be a series of I guess, information uh, interviews with different people that you find really interesting, whose career journeys that you, you really uh, admire and appreciate so that you can draw from each one of those people a little bit about their experiences and, and um, yeah, their advice in terms of, of their mistakes and their successes. Mm. Um, Ian, are your thoughts on sort of refining the information or the, the, what may be information overload from, from a mentor? Um, I'm still thinking about this one. I think you can let Tsekha Fata go. Uh, okay, I'm gonna throw it over to Tsekha. Okay, so for me, the information overload, before it even happens, it's a case of intention because the, you have to, through every session that you actually have with your mentor, there's an intent on what, what you actually want to get out of it, right? So the intention needs to be clear so that by at the time the information overload actually happens, you have like the spirit of discernment to actually discern between all the bits and bobs that you have to take from that. So I always like intention is one of the most important things to starting and maintaining a mentor and mentee relationship. So once you have that clear, I think the information overload, it's quite an easy, an easy situation to navigate. Mm. Um, and, and this actually made a question pop up in my mind while you were actually speaking. And I'd like, actually like to ask Cassidy um, how they sort of manage this at, at, at uh, Who's Your Mama and if they do sort of advise 
what kind of schedule you should set with a mentor. Um, is it something that you should let happen organically or is it something that's sort of like uh, Teho was saying, sort of set an intention and be very clear about sort of how often do we see each other? Can I call you? What, what are the boundaries of our communications? Um, yeah, how do you guys do it at Who's Your Mama? I think it's a really, really important question and something that you definitely need to discuss um, from the get-go with your, your mentor, sh mentor should you decide together that you want to continue that relationship. Um, we actually ask in our application form how many hours a month you have to allocate or dedicate to this. And of course, people are really busy these days. I mean, I think they've always been busy, but specifically after lockdown, people seem to be much busier. Um, with less time to, to do this kind of thing, because bearing in mind from a mental perspective as well, they're using time that they could be dedicating to their own uh, career development to help you in yours. Um, and that's what, even though that's very fulfilling, uh, it is definitely time that's taken out of their, their day. So I think it's really important to, to figure out what is reasonable and uh, realistic from both sides, from both parties. Um, and to make it work for you. Um, we sometimes have a contract pledge that we encourage our mentor uh, relationships to, to sign at the beginning and, and go back to, to really outline that. It's quite, it can be quite formal and sometimes people don't want it to be that formal, but at least having that conversation and agreeing on it. And then I think what's most important there is sticking to it, especially from a mentee's perspective and, and really driving that from their side is really, really mm -hmm. important. Thank you so much for that. And, and I hope, um, you know, the peeps in the gallery are going to use this as they approach sort of people that they are wanting to, to be mentored by. Um, but yeah, a final question, um, and I'm going to pose this to you, Lisejo. Um, it's, it's from Takia. Um, sometimes a mentor-mentee relationship is not a good fit. How can you tell when this is the case and how do you navigate that without tarnishing relationships? Um, and if anyone wants, anyone else wants to jump on this after Lisa, please do feel free. Yeah, I think the only, the only point where I uh, would say that a mentor mentee relationship isn't a good fit is if <clears throat> the mentee who's looking for mentorship and the mentor don't necessarily have um, synergy in terms of their skills and skill sets. For example, I didn't get that. Not Could you, you try again? Not you, sorry. <laughs> Siri wants um, some yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, what I, well, Ask me what I'm saying. There isn't um, the synergy between the skill sets. So for example, if a art director seeking mentorship for a copywriter, yes, I know there may be some sort of, you know, overlays by the very nature of the relationship, but hypothetically speaking, um, that could be cause for a bit of a mismatch. And because of that mismatch, only then do I then see it not actually working out. But everything beyond that, um, I, I don't foresee it you know, actually you know, bringing out forth those slashes, just coming down for me to those, to those the skill sets and whether or not there's a match there. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, does anyone else wanna tackle that um, before? I can't believe the hour's up already. Um, it's, it's been such a sort of engaging session. But if anyone else wants to tackle the, the, the question about sort of um, how to navigate a, a relationship that may not be working with a mentor, I think that was you, Cassidy? Yes, if I could jump in here, thank you so much. Um, I, I said it before about um, mentorships needing chemistry, and I think both parties usually can tell when that chemistry isn't there, and, and that's totally okay. Um, and we've had a few of these situations in the past with our matches, um, as I've said, and we always say, whatever you do, do it elegantly and respectfully, and you know, be open about the fact that that person might not um, be I guess, providing the kind of um, advice or guidance that you might need if you're a mentee. Or from a mentorship, a mentor's perspective, uh, explaining that uh, they might not have the time or they don't think they'll be able to offer the kind of guidance that that mentee might need. I think that's a, just a, an easy conversation to be had, but I think it's something that has to be had, not just ghosting the person and um, not responding to them. Um, it can just be done very respectfully. I hear you 100%. And I think a vital um, piece of advice that, you know, even if something is not working, we can uh, navigate it, we can talk it through. And, you know, and, and that's just sort of part of the journey, you know, some things don't work and you just, you know, keep it pushing and just work around it. Um, 
I think we could all sit here all day uh, having this inspired discussion, but um, I also know that we all have much to do ahead of our Youth Day break tomorrow. So I am going to end this awesome um, panel session here. Uh, thank you so much to, to all our engaged panelists. Your insights have been so valuable and, and I think we hope that the generations currently and before us in the gallery taken notes uh, and we see some energized moves in the, man, in the, in the matter of mentorship. Um, before we go, a big thank you to the IAB um, and our partners for making this possible for today. Um, and the winner of our prize, yeah, we have not forgotten about you, the winner of Kojo Buffo's um, Listen to Your Footsteps. And I, again, I really hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, is Dristi Mohanal. I really hope that I have said that correctly, but uh, we will be in touch with you uh, to deliver your prize to you. Well done and on staying engaged on social media and for attending the session today. Um, thank you to our lovely audience in the gallery. You have been stellar. Have a great day and I think make the most of the youth day tomorrow. Um, and yeah, I'm signing out there. Have an amazing day, everybody, and a great week ahead. Thank you.